1 Samuel 29, if you please join with me. David is rejected and rescued by the good hand of God. 1 Samuel 29. Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek, while the Israelites were camping by the spring which is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines were proceeding on by hundreds and by thousands. And David and his men were proceeding in the rear with Achish. Then the commanders of the Philistines said, What are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish said to the commanders of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, the king of David, who has been with me these days, or rather these years? And I have found no fault in him from the day he deserted to me to this day. But the commanders of the Philistines were angry with him. And the commanders of the Philistines said to him, Make the man go back, that he may return to his place where you have assigned him, and do not let him go down to battle with us, or in the battle he may become an adversary to us. For with what could this man make himself acceptable to his Lord? Would it not be with the heads of these men? Is this not David, of whom they sing in the dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? Then Achish called David and said to him, As the Lord lives, you have been upright, and your going out and your coming in with me in the army are pleasing in my sight. For I have not found evil in you from the day of your coming to me to this day. Nevertheless, you are not pleasing to the sight of the Lord's. Now therefore return and go in peace, that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. David said to Achish, But what have I done? And what have you found in your servant from the day when I came before you to this day, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord, the king? But Achish replied to David, I know that you are pleasing in my sight, like an angel of God. Nevertheless, the commanders of the Philistines have said, He must not go up with us to the battle. Now then, arise early in the morning with the servants of your Lord who have come with you, and as soon as you have risen early in the morning and have light, depart. So David arose early, he and his men, to depart in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Now may the Lord bless the reading of His Word and our time and study this morning. Let's pray. Well, before we go into 1 Samuel 29, I need to catch us up a little bit on what's going on in this particular chapter. Before I go into that, let's talk a little bit about 1 Samuel 27. Actually, verse 1 answers the whole chapter when you read verse 1 of chapter 27. David has been on the run from Saul for years now, and the Lord has miraculously continued to take care of him. And note what he says in verse 1, 1 Samuel 27. David said to himself, Now I will perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape into the land of the Philistines. Saul then will despair of searching for me any more in the territory of Israel, and I will escape from his hand. Congregation, listen to me. Never say, there is nothing better for me when it contradicts the Word of God. Don't say it. Don't think it. You see, 1 Samuel 22.5, the prophet Gad had told David specifically, stay in the tribal land of Judah. Stay there. The Lord is going to take you. There's enemies of Saul all over, but the Lord's going to take care of you. And yet, David does not. Well, then it begs the question, is it wrong to speak to yourself? I mean, David was speaking to himself here. Maybe that's part of the issue. Well, it depends, right? It depends on what you say to yourself. We see early in Psalm 42, 11, where David says, Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. That was right thinking. That was right talking to yourself. You see, the issue is David now is no longer hoping and trusting in the Lord. He's trusting in himself. So he moves to Philistia. He knows Saul won't attack him there. Pragmatically speaking, it works, but it's not what the word of the Lord would have for him. 
So David becomes a Philistine servant to Achish, whose Achish is the Lord of Gath. He deceives Achish into thinking he is killing Israelites in the Negev. Negev is a southern wilderness of Israel. You see, he deceives Achish uh, into thinking he's killing all these Israelites, but he's not. He's actually killing the desert nations of the Negev. Some Israel's enemies, like the Amalekites, some not. Either way, though, Achish never finds out about it. You know why? Because David kills every man, woman, and child in those places. So it's not possible for Achish to find out what he's really doing. Dr. Johnson writes about this when he preached on it. He says, what is the sin underneath David's sin of butchery? It's unbelief. David has forgotten the Lord's salvations of the past and the Lord's promises as well. So the end of the episode with Achish, we see Achish telling David to prepare and go fight against the Israelites. You see, what David may have forgotten, or perhaps he thought he could snake his way out, to accept a sanctuary in a foreign country was an obligation to serve in that country's military. So what was David's response? Very well. You will then now see what your servant can do. A bit vague, perhaps. Well, that's the end of chapter 27. And David, uh, rather, Dr. Johnson writes, David must have been very, very disturbed over the position in which he found himself. I think that's so illustrative of our experiences when we step out of the will of God. What a net our sins weave for us to be imprisoned by. What a trap we build for ourselves when we sin. One sin leads to another sin and makes necessary still another and for David, he's not willing to trust God's care over him. He steps out of the will of God, moves into Philistia, and every step after that is a step downward, and also a step that must have disturbed him in his inmost being. So when I refer to stepping outside of the will of God, certainly we don't step outside of God's decreed will for our lives, but certainly what the Lord has revealed in His Word, yes, we can step out of that, and we do it often. Cap, that was chapter 27. Chapter 28, the, the film then scans over to Saul, who's now visiting the witch of Endor. He can't get God to respond to him because of his sin, and he's unwilling to repent. And so somehow it seems the spirit of Samuel, perhaps there's some debate on this, reveals to Saul that he and his sons are going to die the next day as they battle with the Philistines. So we leave Saul leaving the witch of Endor, into the darkness of night. What you're going to see in the final chapters of 1 Samuel is, is sort of a back and forth between the two anointed ones of God. The one anointed one of David, and Saul also who was considered an anointed one. David being the true one that I think we will all see in heaven. So today in 1 Samuel 29, after a lengthy introduction, how we're going to see how the Lord saves a lying, butchering David from two really bad options. Either fighting against his own country, or number two, being killed by Achish for disloyalty. A Presbyterian commentator named Davis writes, The God who saved David from Saul again and again will surely save him from himself. You see, inexhaustible mercy does not dry up easily. The Lord in this chapter is going to chase David down in His mercy. He's going to chase him in goodness and loving kindness. And ladies and gentlemen, be encouraged. He does that with us today. Verse 1 and 2 of chapter 29. Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek, while the Israelites were camping by the spring which is in Jezreel. And the Lord of the Philistines were proceeding on by hundreds and by thousands. And David and his men were proceeding on in the rear with Achish. Looking at the geography, the Philistines are at Aphek. It's the same place they defeated Israel 90 years earlier and stole the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, Israel is in the meantime in the mountain range called Gilboa. We'll see that later on where Saul is killed or perhaps kills himself. And notice we have the lords of the Philistines, and you've got hundreds of thousands of Philistines parading in front of them. What's going on? Well, these are military inspections before they head north to take 
on Israel. And if you remember, there are five large cities of Philistia, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekron, Gaza, and Gath. Now, I tend to be a bit nerdish when it comes to these things, but may, perhaps you can indulge me. I often wonder, where are those cities now? Are they still in existence? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, Ashdod and Ashkelon are actually two thriving Jewish cities to this day. They built upon the, some of the mounds of those areas. Gaza is, as you know, owned by the Arabs in the Gaza Strip. And then you've got Ekron and Gath, and those two cities are now in ruins. We're not sure exactly where Ekron is, but they have found Gath. And you know what's interesting? Just six years ago, 2015, they found the entrance to the city of Gath. It was discovered. It's the largest gate ever found in Israel. And you go, why would they need such a large gate? Well, remember, Goliath was from Gath. Perhaps that had something to do with it. Or maybe it was because the city was actually four times the size of Jerusalem. It's huge at that time period. So, Achish, he's just one of those five lords, and he's lord over Gath, and you've got David and his men who are with him. Notice the response of the Philistine lords from the other cities. Verse 3, Then the commander of the Philistines said, and they say this in the, in the Hebrew, What? Hebrews? <laughs> and Achish said to the commanders of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, who has been with me in these days, or rather these years? Because by that time it had been about 16 months that he'd been staying with Achish. And I have found no fault in him from the day he deserted to me to this day. Now notice the Philistines don't call them Israelites. And that's on purpose. Uh, most or perhaps all of the Gentile nations would refer to them as Hebrews, which is another name to refer to the Israelites as. But these four other lords of the Philistine cities are in shock. What? Hebrews? And the, the point of it is, is we're going to fight the Hebrews and we've got them on our team as well. And notice how Achish seeks to, dis, uh, to defend his decision. It's very strange. He said, he's a servant of, of Saul, the king of Israel. <laughs> Achish probably should have left that part out. He's not going to gain any points with them with this. And he says, I found no fault in him. Ironically, Achish actually will defend David three times in this chapter, twice to the Philistines and once to David. And I think there's something happening here that the text doesn't say right here, but I think it's uh, looking at the archaeological finds of that time and knowing the pattern of way of life is when David came back from these raids, perhaps he gave Achish a cut of some of the goods and money that he had, he had received. And so Achish is thinking, I'm, I'm profiting off of this guy. Remember, David is not living with Achish. David asked for his city, Ziklag, off to the side. So he wouldn't be a bother to Achish, if you will. And so David's able to run all these covert operations, which uh, ultimately, it, it seems to help him in Achish's eyes, even though it was wrong. He should have stayed in Judah. So he's put himself in a really bad spot. But note what's going on here. The commanders of the Philistines. Could God use such wicked men as these? Oh, stay with me. Verse 4 and 5. But the commanders of the Philistines were angry with him. And the commanders of the Philistines said to him, Make the man go back, that he may return to his place where you have assigned him. And do not let him go down to battle with us. Or in the battle he may become an adversary to us. For with what could this man make himself acceptable to his Lord. Would it not be with the heads of these men? Is this not David of whom they sing in the dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? So they have two reasons why we're not taking David with us. Uh, number one, um, he could turn on us. I mean, what, the best way that David could get back in good graces with his former lord, Saul, would be the heads of our men. What are you thinking, Aphek? Or rather, Achish. And number two, look at the history. Perhaps uh, not only the history of David, but the history of the top 40 hits in the Middle East at that time. Catch that. Did you see it? They sing in the dances. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. 
I don't mean to be trite with the text. That was a song at that time. And not only was it a famous song, but it says here that there were dance moves associated with this song. Even the Philistines know of this song. So it's like they're saying, David has already killed thousands of people. Our people, what are you thinking? See, these Philistines knew something. They knew it's a bad idea to trust former enemies. Continuing on. What we're going to see here is that God is going to use Philistine lords who will soon execute Saul in battle. He's using these same Philistine lords to save David, the future king. You, you know what that means, of course, right? Psalm 23 is true. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Yes, the Lord is chasing down David with his goodness and loving kindness. And by the way, it's not the only time Philistines saved David. When the Ziphites told David of David's whereabouts in 1 Samuel 23, Saul brings his army down there, his choice picked army, and he almost caught David. But what happened? Saul received a report that the Philistines were raiding Israel, thus causing Saul to rush back home to his capital. <laughs> God's amazing providence. <laughs> I like to quote Davis once again, the commentator. He says, The Philistines make such unwitting but effective servants. When it says, He provides a table before me in the presence of my enemies, sometimes the Lord uses His own enemies to make the table. And that's clearly what God is using here. He's using Philistine lords, the enemies of Israel, to save David. Verse 6 and 7, Then Achish called David and said to him, As the Lord lives, you have been upright, and you're going out and you're coming in with me, and the army are pleasing in my sight. For I have not found evil in you from the day of your coming to me to this day. Nevertheless, you are not pleasing in the sight of the Lord's. Now therefore, return and go in peace, that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines." What's interesting here is Achish actually, he, when he uses the phrase, as the Lord lives, he's swearing to David by the Lord God of Israel. And then it begs the question, has Achish become a believer in the Lord? I, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I think he's probably just using the title as a means of proving his sincerity to David. As the Lord God, your God lives, David Basically, notice what he says to him. You've been upright. You've been pleasing in my sight. I have not found evil in you. You know what this in some ways reveals to us? An unbeliever's stupidity. This guy doesn't know that David's been playing him for a rube for, for 16 months. Doesn't have any ideas. Now keep in mind, believers can be just as, as foolish. Thankfully, we have the Spirit of God that convicts us on things. But this guy is, he's out in left field, as they say. But nevertheless, he tells David, you're not pleasing in the sight of the Lord. Return and go in peace. So basically what he's telling David is, I, I'm outnumbered here. Four to one. You have to go. The Lord has just saved David through the hands of the Philistines. What do you figure David's response would be? Thank you so much. That's not his response. Note what he says in verse 8. He continues the deception. David said to Achish, But what have I done? And what have you found in your servant from the day when I came before you to this day, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? What, <laughs> what are you thinking, David? Is David a couple of sandwiches short of a picnic? What's happening? That's what I want to know. What are you saying? Well, it's almost like you think to yourself, if you could go back in time, you're saying, David, hey, don't push it here. Don't push it, okay? You've, you've made your deception clear. Well, it's interesting the terms that David used. You may have caught it. Sort of the nebulous way that he explains this. First, he certainly seems uh, that thou dost protest too much. But he also says, note this, 
when I came before you to this day, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my Lord, the King. Did you catch it? I think some of you may have. Some of you go, no, just tell me what it is. My Lord, the King, is he referring to Achish? Is he referring to Saul? Is he referring to the Lord? <laughs> Interesting. He's being intentionally vague. I'm certain in David's own heart of hearts, he was referring to Saul or the Lord. He's not referring to Achish. He's not going to turn on the Israelites. But note how Achish replies to David in verses 9 through 11. I know that you are pleasing in my sight like an angel of God. By the way, that phrase, you are like an angel of God to me. You'll see that in a few other places in Scripture. It's a very common expression of the day as if this is the, you're the best here. Continuing on, Nevertheless, the commanders of the Philistines have said, He must not go up with us to the battle. Now when then arise early in the morning with the servants of your Lord who have come with you, and as soon as you have arisen early in the morning and have light, depart. So David arose early, he and his men to depart in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. So Achish reviews the conversation he had with the other lords. What it comes down to in three words, you can't come. You can't come. Now, it's interesting that the Spirit was the one who write, wrote the Scriptures through the hands of men. Note what it says. Arise early in the morning with the servants of your Lord who have come with you. Early in the morning. Daylight. That may not mean anything to you. But if you read 1 Samuel 28, it might. Once again, the Spirit is doing this sort of back and forth between the lives of David and and Saul, and David, and Saul. Yes, they're both anointed ones, but who's the one who truly follows the Lord, the one whom the Lord has elected as king? What's well, David? In 1 Samuel 28, Saul is leaving the witch of Endor, and note what it says in verse 25. First off, this. Everybody knows he's going at night. It already said in the text that Saul is going to visit the witch at night, which is what darkness does. It doesn't like to be around light goes and visits at dark. But note what happens in verse 25 once he's done with the witch. After Saul sees the witch, he walks off with his men, and it says, and I quote, they went away that night. That should draw your mind to a passage from John. John 14, where in Judas, after Jesus has told him, whatever you do, go do quickly. And Judas is going to betray him, and it says, Four words in the English. And it was night. The Spirit is telling you something. Are you catching it? You look at the life of Judas, you see the life of Saul, and they're departing at night. It's a place of darkness, a place of sin. Now, compare that to chapter 29, verse 11. A, as the Lord saves David and chases him down with his goodness and loving kindness, David walks away with his army in the morning light. It's meant to be a picture for you to catch. Oh, I see. This is the way it works. The Lord's man walks away in light. The one who turns away from the Lord walks in darkness. Well, that's the chapter. We could be done today, but you're not getting out that early. There's a lot of conclusion here, and there's a whole lot of application I think the Lord could have for us. And that is this, primarily. The Lord rescues. He takes care of His own. As we're going to see, He chases us down in loving kindness and goodness. Do you know something, Believer's Chapel? Do you know the Lord promises to keep you from evil? He actually does that. Let's talk about what the Scriptures say about this. It says in 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, The Lord is faithful who will establish you and keep you from evil. Or as some of the translations say, keep you from the evil one. A.W. Pink, the Australian commentator, writes, The Lord's people are surrounded by the, a variety of evils within and without. They have sin in them, and it is the cause and fountain of all the evil and misery to which they at any time feel and experience. 
There is the evil one without who endeavors at times to bring great evil upon them. But the Lord, quote, keepeth His people from evil. Not that they are exempted wholly and altogether from evil, yet they are kept from being overcome by and engulfed in it. Though they fall, they shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth them with His hand. Or, as I'll hear often from Mr. Black, Psalm 4.3, the Lord sets apart the godly for Himself. What does that mean? That means He favors especially His children, His elect ones. And some might say, well, that, perhaps that's an Old Testament concept that the Lord will keep you from evil. Because when I look at my life, well, hold on, hold on a moment. Is that maybe it's an Old Testament concept that the Lord chases us down in goodness and loving kindness because it doesn't feel like that. Well, hold on, hold on. Paul writes his last letter to Timothy by inspiration of the Spirit, the Lord will rescue me, 2 Timothy 4.18, the Lord will rescue me from every, every evil deed and will bring me safely into His heavenly kingdom. That was perhaps days, weeks, or months before He is beheaded. Taken by the headsman. I don't know about you, but when I consider the possibility of the uh, removal of my head from my body, that doesn't sound like the Lord is rescuing me from every evil deed. Is it? Or maybe you don't understand the biblical text, and I don't understand the biblical text the way that we should understand it. You see, the Bible's clear about these sort of things. But what if your situation doesn't feel as if the Lord is keeping you from evil? Perhaps you've been through divorce, death of a loved one, job loss, COVID, cancer, loneliness, conflict, childlessness. There's so many, I can't list them all. Well, maybe one of the ways to help describe this is tell you about my great-grandpa. You see, in the mornings, he used to love to get up and pour himself a big old glass of buttermilk. I'm just looking at some of your faces. I can tell that doesn't get you right here. Doesn't me either. I don't like the taste of buttermilk. It's... Uh, I mean, you put those two together, butter and milk, and you drink them together. I just, oof. Not to mention your cholesterol, but that's another topic. But you know what? If you put buttermilk together in a pie plate, mm, put yourself a buttermilk pie, I get fat and sassy. I'm telling you what, it's that good. How does that work? How can something so evil as drinking straight buttermilk Tastes so good in a pie. Well, Hebrews 12, 10, Hebrews 12, 11, they disciplined, meaning our earthly fathers disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But He disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. He disciplines us for our, what was that? Good. There it is again. Hebrews 12, 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. But later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. You see, when we go through the trials of life, whatever they might be, beware of trusting in our feelings and circumstances, not in the promises of God, where God can say without declension, Romans 8, 28, that He causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. So how does, how does Joseph deal with this? The hard times of life and the fact that the Lord is going to bring goodness and loving kindness to our own lives out of it. That his brothers would sell him into Egypt. We see in Genesis 50, what you meant is evil, but God meant it for good. And then he says how the Lord would save our entire family as it's becoming a nation down here in Egypt. It should blow your mind when you consider some of the things that God has done in your life. That God has actually meant that for your good. You didn't see it as for your good. You thought it was your terror. But Romans 11.33 states, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. Let me tell you, if the Lord can use Philistine lords 
the same ones that are going to slaughter Israel and King Saul in order to save future King David. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, unfathomable his ways. I read something from Grudem the other day, Wayne Grudem, a theologian who writes about this. He said, God always chooses the best goals and the best means to those goals. I'll say it again. God chooses the best goals. He always chooses the best goals and the best means to those goals. You see, my guess, if you're like me, you know that your ultimate goal is to become like Christ. And so you don't fight the goals. You just don't like the means that the Lord is using. But I think Grudem is right. And he can look at the biblical text and show you. It's not just the goals that are perfect and righteous. It's the means as well. Psalm 145, verse 17, talks about God. It says, He is righteous in all His ways and kind in all His deeds. He doesn't feel kind. It doesn't look righteous at times, but you can't see it. It's buttermilk. And God is making buttermilk pie. To quote A.W. Pink again, Wondrous are the ways in which God preserves His saints. Many a one has been withheld from that success in business on which he had fondly set his heart. It was God delivering him from those material riches which would have ruined his soul. Many a one was disappointed in love. It was God delivering you from an ungodly partner for life who would have been a constant hindrance to your spiritual progress. Many a one was cruelly treated by trusted and cherished friends. It was God breaking what would have proven an unequal yoke. Now we see these things through a glass darkly, but the day will come, dear reader, when we shall perceive clearly that it was the preserving hand of our gracious God, thus dealing with us at those very times when all seemed to be working against us. So once again, Psalm 23, 6 is true. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And yet you've not heard me say follow as much as I have said chase. And that's bothered you because it doesn't say that in your text. Well, my encouragement to you is I don't think follow is actually the best used in the New American Standard. You see, the Hebrew word is radof, radof. And it's better translated pursue or even chase is in a hunt. It's really a, one of the greatest pictures are found in Exodus 14. So would you please turn there? Exodus 14, where it talks about an evil man chasing God's children. We see it four times in this chapter, Radoff. Exodus 14, 4, in verse 8, in verse 9, and verse 23. Verse 4, Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase, that's the word, Chase after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And they did so. In verse 8, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel, as the, as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. Verse 9, then the Egyptians chased after them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh. And finally, in verse 23, as the Egyptians chase and they find the uh, Israelites, they chase after them right into the sea. Verse 23, then the Egyptians took up the pursuit, there's our word, and all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen went in after them into the midst of the sea. You see, I like that word radoff, but I think we've just not done a great job of explaining it that well. You see... Uh, if someone has ever driven behind you as you go to a place, you say, hey, just follow me. And invariably, sometimes they get caught in a light. And if you're following somebody, many times it just doesn't come to fruition. But if you're chasing after somebody, that's all the difference in the world. You've got this, this, this drive that says, I have to catch them. I'm going to catch them. It's not even going to be a doubt in my mind. I will catch them. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is exactly what the Lord does with us. But He chases after us. And if you will, as I mentioned the other day, He's ruthless in chasing after us. He will chase after us with goodness and loving kindness all of our days. Dan Duncan tells the story of um, George Mueller. It's worth repeating. Uh, he spoke at his wife's uh, funeral. February 6, 1870. Note what Mueller has to say about the goodness of God pursuing him in all things. He gave the funeral service of his wife. They'd been married 39 years. The scripture that he chose was Psalm 119, verse 68. Thou art good and doest good. Here is he speaking. The reason why I propose to preach this funeral sermon is not because the late Mrs. Mueller was my own beloved wife, nor that I might have an opportunity of speaking highly of her, most worthy though she was of it, but that I may magnify the Lord in giving her to me, in leaving her to me so long, and in taking her from me to himself. When it pleased God to take my darling wife to himself, my soul was so sustained by these words that if I had gone out that evening to preach, I should have preached on this text. I desire now, as God may help me, for the benefit of my younger fellow believers in Christ particularly, to deal, rather, to dwell on the truth contained in these words with reference to my beloved departed wife. Now he lines out the outline. It's in three points. Number one, the Lord was good and did good in giving her to me. Number two, he was good and did good in so long leaving her to me. And number three, he was good and did good in taking her from me. Perhaps all Christians, he continues, who have heard me will have no difficulty in giving their hearty assent that the Lord was good and doing good in giving me such a wife. And they will also probably most readily admit that he was good and doing good in leaving her to me so long. But I ask these dear Christian friends, friends to go further with me and to say from their hearts, the Lord was good and doing good in the removal of that useful, lovely, excellent wife from her husband. And then at the very time when humanly speaking, he needed her more than ever. While I'm saying this, I feel the void in my heart. That lovely one is no more with me to share my joys and sorrows. Every day I miss her more and more. Every day I see more and more how great her loss to the orphans. Yet without an effort, my inmost soul habitually joys in the joy of that loved, loved departed one. Her happiness gives joy to me. My dear daughter and I would not have her back were it possible to produce it by the turn of the hand. God himself has done it. And we are satisfied with him. The last portion of scripture, which I read to my precious wife, was this. The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Now, if we have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have received grace. We are partakers of grace. And to all such, he will give glory also. I said to myself, with regard to the latter part, no good thing will he withhold from him that walketh uprightly. I am in myself a poor, worthless sinner, but I have been saved by the blood of Christ, and I do not live in sin. I walk uprightly before God. Therefore, if it is really good for me, my darling wife will be raised up again, sick as she is presently. God will restore her again, but... If she is not restored again, then it would not be a good thing for me. And so my heart was at rest. I was satisfied with God. And all this springs, as I have often said before, from taking God at his word and believing what he says. Rodolf, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to know something. The Lord chose to chase you from the beginning of time. He is presently chasing you and has always been chasing you up till now. And forever he will be chasing you, all with goodness and loving kindness, all the way to the gates of heaven and beyond into eternity. 
Be encouraged. If you're an unbeliever, today is the day of salvation. Turn from your sin as your master and trust in a new master who can say he is gentle and humble at heart and you will find rest for your souls. The great shepherd of the sheep, Jesus Christ. Come to him today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace and mercy and pray that you would just grant us that we would live this way, even through horrible trials, that we would see all these things are for my good. You cannot do us wrong. It's not possible for the Lord to do his children wrong. So I pray that even if we mess up our lives as David does at this particular chapter, we would see in your grace that you allowed these things to happen. You brought them safely, brought us safely on the other side. No, that doesn't mean we're not limping. That doesn't mean we don't weep over the choices perhaps that we've made, but we know that all these things are working for our good. Perhaps we see for the first time in our lives that you humiliated us to humble us, to make us more like the Son. Father, anybody in here does not yet know you. There are many, perhaps. I pray that you would grant them eternal life today. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Well, please turn with me to the Songs of Praise book, to hymn number 15, I'm sorry, hymn number 18, In Christ Alone. Please stand. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you 